live on NBS at 10 p.m. Well, we are always so thankful of your loyalty to NBS uh, television. My name is Mebo Chegumiezake, so thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, we're also recognizing our online audience across all our media uh, platforms as you follow this program. Now, a little reminder, yesterday, government, and I will also emphasize government of Uganda for our international audience, released a 48.1 trillion shilling uh, national budget for the financial year 2022-2023. It's based on restoring economic activity uh, to the pre-pandemic levels and also accelerate the pace of social economic transformation. Now, in this special edition of the show, Stanbic Bank, which is one of the top banks in Uganda, so it pertinent to bring into conversation a budget analysis under the theme, reviewing the emerging themes and implications. And of course, I have a great uh, panel. Uh, Dr. Fred Mohomoza, who is an economic advisor, Ministry of Finance, uh, Planning and Economic Development. Welcome. Uh, once was. Once was. But I still advise you. <laughs> You've been told you do all the time. <laughs> yes, I do, but not on a formal invoice basis. Oh. <laughs> there are some people doing that. Okay, he's an economist, a renowned one. And then we have uh, Mr. Daniel Virunji. He's the executive director, Uganda Manufacturers Association. And then the only female on the panel. We should the second female on the panel. The, uh, we don't count myself. Uh, yeah. Why? Yeah, but we appreciate Stanley Bank for actually bringing a female. <laughs> She's Miss Josephine Mokombia, the Executive Director, Agribusiness Development Center. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And then from Stanbic Bank, he's the head of global markets at Stanbic Bank Uganda Limited, and he's Mr. Alan Mohinda. You're Thank you, Mabel. Welcome. Pleasure to be here. The national budget is in conversation this whole week and probably throughout the whole year. So with each and every one of you, I'll start with you, Dr. Fred Mohumuza. What stood out for you in the budget? Uh, thank you, Mabel. The first thing is on the first page, the theme was too broad. So many things in there. I know government wants to do all of them, but the theme could have been condensed into a few crispy things. The words you would want to see there, recovery, stabilization, you know, in this mode where we are right now, you want to see those kinds of things. Uh, but secondly, people need to always know it's budget estimates. So the revenue is an estimate, the expenditure is an estimate. Both of them can go down or up. Quite often the revenues can go down, uh, but the, <laughs> the expenditures <laughs> don't seem to follow. And yet that's one of the terminologies we used to have 20 years back, or maybe 25, cash budgeting. If the cash is not available, you guys go and deal with the expenditure and bring it down. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also commitment control system within government. These are terminologies in government that are supposed to be the operating principles behind the budget. Mm -hmm. Commitment control system literally means don't commit government if you do not have the money. money. Now when you hear arrears, government having to budget for 500, 600 billion to pay arrears. Mm. And by the way, they are much higher than that. Mm. You begin to say, what happened to the principles of budget execution? Mm. So these usually in the first very par first paragraph of that budget speech, you'll find it say, constitutionally, Article 155, the president shall cause estimates of revenue and expenditure to be submitted to, to parliament. Mm. Now those are two important things. One of the other said is the, these are estimates. Mm. The future is not known where this budget is going to lie, and that should be our conversation. What are the pitfalls and opportunities that will lie, uh, lie behind and in front of this budget? To the president. The budget belongs to the president. So many times, uh, as you've said, I was advisor in government, I still do advise, and we get back to those principles. Such a critical tool is a political tool. We're talking about the president. But also you don't come back to tell me cabinet decided or so and so decided. The budget belongs to sure. the president. So if you have any hiccup, any challenges as technocrats, run to the president. Mm -hmm. And he's the de facto minister of finance. Give him the facts. Okay. Even when the president himself has said, if the facts are speaking differently, Mr. President, I want to put before you the facts. But now I hear people orders from above and then so and so said, Okay. This is political. Those are the kinds of things you want to say. How do we go back? Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Binunji, were you listening with a bias? Of course, for <laughs> Uma. <laughs> <laughs> to be specific, what was your <coughs> takeaway? Guilty as child, I was listening with a oh, bias. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but yes, takeaways. One is, uh, I think there's a realization that there's a desire to try and balance the different aspects in the budget. Mm -hmm. For the first time, we saw an increment in the allocation to agro-industrialization. Mm -hmm. uh, but like someone said, when you dig <laughs> deep into the figures, you suddenly start questioning. But this agro-industrialization that involves expenditures at foreign missions, mm -hmm. how do the two tie in together? There, there are questions there. The other bit that, of course, stood out for me is that finally, we are moving to cash basis accounting for farms that have supplied government. There's been a significant cash flow crunch mm. for companies that have supplied government and have to wait two years to be paid. And yet the revenue, uh, the, the tax collector is at their door saying, pay me, you've supplied. That's sufficient for me to, to take money off you. The other bit f as a point of worry was that in spite of what we are seeing in the economy now, there's a projected increase in tax collection by three trillion uh, Uganda shillings. Why that worries me and why that would worry any formal business is the usual target for any of these measures is the formal entities. And this only means that the cow that has been struggling to give milk is going to be squeezed even further Father. until there is blood coming into the milk. Because we are seeing a lot of businesses falling by the wayside as it is now. But when you say you're going to raise uh, the target by three trillion shillings, what does that mean? It means, of course, the revenue authority is going to squeeze taxpayers even more. Lastly, for me, as a headline, yeah. would be the decision on uh, rental income tax and the impact that has on an already squeezed uh, economy as far as the construction sector is concerned. Because if I know that I'm going to pay 30% uh, of my income in, in, in tax contribution, but I'm only going to cap my expenditure to 50% of whatever uh, I collect. And yet I have the option of investing in bonds at 15, 16%. I think at that point it becomes a, a moot point that I will go for the easier investment. Mm -hmm. So those are the headlines mm -hmm. that I picked out of the budget. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ms. Mukumbia. Oftentimes, our parents used to tell us that each time your sector or field was actually, you know, uh, uh, if it received an increase in terms of, you know, budget, like he mentioned, there was an increase, we were surprised in the agro, you know, uh, industry, they would celebrate, people would even jump up and down. <laughs> Did you do something like that <laughs> coming from the agribusiness field? Um, the main thing that jumps out at me in this particular budget is how it's a program yeah. versus a pure sector. Yeah. So there's a different way in which to review each of these programs. Yes, we are very pleased about the agro-industry or having that percentage, but it is, it, we, we need to keep finding the ag in terms of its basic form across the different programs. Mm. And I try to do that. I try to find the climate change, what is it speaking to. I try to find th the varied areas. Mm -hmm. Even governance and security, I'm trying to find that if indeed we are well governed and all, it's giving room and an environment for ag growing. So yes, we are pleased, but the devil is in the detail. It is how the allocation of that ag industrialization program lies. But um, uh, surprisingly, beyond that specific thing, I was also pleased to note uh, the intentionality about curbing uh, prices, uh, or so to speak, because at least the, the paper was also speaking a different language in that regard, speaking to what do we need to do at the production level, mm. what kind of subsectors and oil seeds come to mind, and the how was not very clear, but I think the intentionality about uh, the subsector of oil seeds and about um, uh, using appropriate and the key word here is appropriate fiscal mm -hmm. uh, 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 policies that can, <laughs> can see us uh, see a bit of, of, to me, I call it the short term. In the short term, we need to see an addressing of the prices so that we are here long enough to generate the business for tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Yes. And then, Mr. Mohinda, what was it for you? Well, Mabel, you know that uh, we are coming off two very difficult years. Mm -hmm. Just as we're recovering, and now we're talking about price pressures. So as 
any ordinary Ugandan, I'm, I'm looking at the budget statement and when I wrap everything, I want to think about what are my earning prospects? <laughs> How are my earnings going to be improved? Mm. And I think in trying to answer that, I think the highlight for me was um, the parish development model mm -hmm. and specifically the amount of money that is being uh, uh, committed to the parish development model. At one trillion, that's about 4% of uh, you know, our mm -hmm. annual revenue if we are able to achieve it. It's a huge statement of intent. Um, why is that so? I think for the first time, uh, we are seeing that such, amount, such an amount is being committed at the lowest level possible, you know. Mm. Um, the second thing, of course, is, you know, if, if you look at the size, you know, at about roughly about $100 for the three odd million households across the different parishes. Yes, it may not be enough, but I think it sends the right message. Um, the issue might be in, uh, you know, coordinating the activities and actually delivering the program, but mm. the intentions are great. And I think at the end of the day, irrespective of the outcome, one thing we can be sure of is that we are going to build a good database at a parish level mm -hmm. that can be used for better planning in the future. Mm. Yeah. And coming back to you, Dr. Mahomaza, I will start where Mr. Mahindra, uh, <laughs> the issues was actually talking about. You mentioned about the difficulties, mm -hmm. the price pressures, but at the same time, he went back to the ordinary Ugandan. He placed himself in, in those shoes. So speaking about those concerns and uh, saying that the budget actually addressed some of those uh, concerns, from your opinion, if it did, do they, does, did it even project implementation? Yeah, I think all is that the devil is in that implementation, in implementation, and uh, sadly, quite often in Uganda, I'm like, it shouldn't be coming from a government person. <laughs> Don't pride yourself in failure to implement your good policies, because then I would even question whether they were good in the first place. So you begin to look at the parish development model, quite a good initiative, and very many people have been comparing it with the previous programs, mm. saying we have been there before, what happened? Now, the difference between the parish development model and the others, it was comprehensive, trying to look at all the seven pillars. Because mm. as we were just beginning to assess its rollout, which was supposed to be this year, a lot of pillars began this year. Mm. We realized you do not have uh, 5,600 sub parish chiefs. Yeah. Now, these are the real supervisors of the government programs at that lower level. They were missing. And I think about 714 town councils and sub counties didn't have town clerks, mm. but because they are formed on the basis of politics. Mm. So it's split up to create councillors, to create a mayor, so that line runs faster because mm -hmm. the electoral commission must beat its deadline. But now nobody comes to up to say, okay, is this town council operational? Because the person to operationalize it is actually the town clerk. Yeah. If it's not in that office, then you're going to have a problem. So we still have a lot more to go mm -hmm. to get value out of this because the Paris development model, the the trillions are going to go to the subsistence farmers. Because they are saying the others who are not farmers will get from a mioga if you're in those commercial areas. Mm. Then those who are not subsistence, already they are moving. One, that's why the, the theme begins with monetization. Yeah. One brings these subsistence people into monetization. Mm. But just like the president mentioned and the minister, the, the, the first getting into the middle income status, you must be there for three years to be declared now a middle status income country. You can easily slip back. Mm -hmm. And the president's prayer was, I hope we do everything, we don't go back. And for me, that's the message you want to see. Mm -hmm. So you can easily get people from to subsistence, give them money, they plant, they are maize. But now they have to rely on that other person who is supposed to buy from them. And those are the conversations we are having. Mm -hmm. If this farmer produces his one sack of maize, who is going to buy it? But also, where did he get the maize seed? Mm -hmm. The agro-dealer, is that agro-dealer funded? The person to handhold them through the season, the extension staff, are they in place? We're still having a shortfall of over 3,000 of those. So there's still a number of things as we were having our conversation earlier. It's a football mm. team. You need all the 11 players on the pitch. Yeah. Don't say me, I have a goalkeeper and a striker, man. You're going to have problems yeah. getting any results out of that stadium. Okay. Let's talk about our, our labor force, Mr. Daniel Birunji. Now, for Ugandaman, 
manufacturing association or the industry itself has a strength which dictates the level of output, right? Of course, into the markets. Now, if our enterprise constitutes about uh, 630,000 of the manufacturing labor force, and looking at the budget that was read yesterday, did the interventions appropriately address that? Okay, uh, first off, I think it's 600,000 direct. Oh, direct. Direct jobs. Oh, okay. And for every one manufacturing job, you have seven indirect jobs. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's, a clear, there's a clear benefit there. Mm -hmm. Now, did it address the needs of industry? Uh, I would say yes and no. Mm -hmm. On the plus side, uh, like the previous speakers have mentioned, the focus on uh, PDM could have a significant impact on improving low-level household income, which could trickle into the ability of the average Ugandan to purchase some of the products on the market. So that's a, a potential positive there. Mm. The changes in the VAT uh, law for SMEs, as far as their supplies to government are concerned, positive. But on the other side, I think the challenge remains that the average industry is operating at less than installed capacity, probably 40-50% of capacity, because they do not have a market for their products. And I, had, I would have wanted, we would have wanted to see a deeper focus on market development. So are you as saying key. That, is, that is one of the areas that wasn't addressed? It wasn't effectively addressed. Okay. And uh, to this, I would say, one is, you know that we are speaking about DRC at the moment mm -hmm. as a potential game changer for this, for this economy. It would have been nice to see more targeted interventions mm. to DRC and to access to DRC so that our people can send their products there. Mm. But beyond that, what are the targeted interventions for access to even the East African market? Because we've had significant challenges. We're still talking Rwanda three years later, three, four years later, mm. and, and lack of access to that market. Mm. We're still talking about inability to send our chicken to, to, to Kenya. Uh, we would have wanted to see a bit more in as far as market access is concerned. Mm -hmm. Granted, there is a renewed focus on human capital development yeah. and the fact that there is an investment in improving the skill sets of Ugandans and in their ability to move, uh, to, to move themselves forward. But could we also see a deeper focus on enterprise development? There's a private sector development program, yes, but what is the percentage of the budget that's allocated to it and how much impact is that going to have on the, on the capacity of these businesses to, to actually thrive? We then address the economists like Dr. Muhumuza would say, or oh, maybe tap into the public-private collaborations. Yeah, partnerships, <laughs> speak to that. There you go. I, I think one of the things that has been pending for a while is, 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 a, is a development of a PPP law mm -hmm. that encourages and, and clearly delineates how government and private sector work together on some of these projects. Those are missed opportunities, mm -hmm. but like I said, yes and no. Some elements, yes, speak to growth of industry. Some elements do not. Okay. Okay, Ms. Mukombe, maybe you speak to the challenges that you feel were addressed. Because uh, year in after year, as media, we keep quoting these figures. Agriculture employs you know, yeah. over 50% of Uganda's informal and informal uh, sector. So speak to at least the challenges that you feel were addressed in terms of commercialization yeah. of agriculture. Um, I think there's always the issue that comes up as a challenge, the post harvest handling and it has a direct link to our ability to market mm. and uh, I have really seen in very recent times um, how um, just a difference of a store to uh, an, an area cooperative improves their revenue you know like mm. year on year like 2020 2021 like threefold because by being able to collect and pull together they, uh, uh, and that was SCDP mainly, in, in areas where the SCDP has worked well, uh, the program of agricultural cluster development, you find that with the creation or the embracing of uh, collective marketing in a storage facility that they now own, they really can improve their revenue, they improve the loyalty of their membership, and they can collectively bargain. So when I saw this as part of still the agro-industrial package, 
um, and, and it, it has been partnered not just that but also with quality improvements and it spoke about market competitiveness and entry not just in local but regional markets. I, I got hope because mm. I, know, I know that we've been speaking to um, why don't we push back in East African community uh, against uh, what's happening to our poultry, what's happening to our milk. And, um, and this particular minister actually of East Africa, she, she really tries to bring this to the table. So I, I saw hope in that particular statement there and that particular budgeting there that we really would want to push back and be able to get entry into the market because what will it help us if indeed we have more production happening through PDM, we have more engagement, people mm -hmm. are collecting, but we cannot get into the market. Mm -hmm. It will be, yeah. So that particular thing was uh, very important to me. I also love the human capital development because I think it's going to help us address a specific demographic challenge. Um, this youth and a lack of employment um, at agriculture, uh, at, at, at the Agribusiness Development Center, we are looking to doing uh, business accelerator opportunities. And we thought that this could be a very great opportunity if there's already uh, a government budgeting and government programs where youth and women specifically are being given toolkits, are being given opportunities uh, from e-learning platforms. We could just see how we could plug in and play in terms of a partnership, a, pub, a public-private partnership, so to speak. Mm. So there are challenges there specifically on issues that have, uh, have plagued us for a while that are, are trying to be addressed and there are opportunities for us as, as the private sector that we can tap into. Okay. Yeah. Let's go back to the everyday person. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mahindra, you're a uh, financial markets uh, professional. Even <coughs> after all the modalities within the budget, and I remember Dr. Mumuza called them uh, budget estimates, yeah. there are always those uh, factors that could actually hinder the budget's objective or achieving the budget ob objectives as it ex extends to the everyday person. How would you categorize them and what are some of those factors that, that would actually uh, hinder? Yeah. Well, this year's budget is, is um, set in a very unique environment and a global unique environment, mm -hmm. I must say, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you want to think about it from the disruption mm -hmm. to production, the disruption to uh, transportation mm -hmm. that has arisen out of two main things. The first one, of course, being COVID, mm -hmm. right? Factories globally shut down. Uh, China was particularly negatively impacted. Um, but at the same time, the shutting down of factories meant that also, you know, ships abandoned containers. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. Now, as a result of that, we've seen that uh, transportation costs have gone up. When you shut down a factory, it is very expensive mm -hmm. to restart it. Yeah. So just as we were dealing with that, then we had uh, you know, this unfortunate uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war. Uh, it has affected two countries that uh, do produce a lot in terms of oil, in terms of grain, cereal, wheat, etc. Again, that also is something that is out of Uganda, but is going to impact you know, how this budget is achieved. The result of all of that, of course, is that we now are dealing with a question of price pressures, or what some people call inflation. And uh, in some places, maybe not yet in Uganda, but in some places, particularly in the Western world, they are talking about 40-50 um, year uh, high inflation rates. Yeah. We've started to see that also coming into Uganda. I think for the last five years, our inflation rate averaged about 2.6. Mm -hmm. Today we are talking about a 6%. Yes. But what's the implication of all of that? Uh, we have seen that, for example, in the Western world, they are st starting to increase interest rates as a way of fighting inflation. Never mind that, you know, some of the causes are really out of any economist's control. But I think the worry is that, you know, if the price increments go unchecked, then maybe we could have a bigger problem, you know, down the road. Mm. So we see interest increases in the Western world. I don't think that uh, Uganda is a unique case. 
we've also started to see those interest increases. So it boils down now to two things. The first one I think is, you know, where you're talking about inflation uh, or price pressures and you're talking about higher interest rates, affordability becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. And at a very personal level, I'm also having to see, okay, how do we reallocate some of my resources, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, at some point, you know, this could be a discussion area given the budget estimates that we have. But I think the bigger one, which has been touched on by uh, Dr. Muhumuza mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Birundi, the cost of financing this budget, because there's, there's also quite a significant portion that is mm -hmm. going to be borrowed. Mm -hmm. I think in total it's about nine, nine to ten trillion. The cost of financing will certainly come into play, uh, it's likely to increase. And depending on the increments, it could impact, uh, you know, uh, the government being able to deliver on some of these budget estimates. Mm. But I think in, 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 you know, in every troubled spot, there is always a silver lining. And, and for me, the two things I pick out of here are one, if the outlook for international oil prices is anything to go by, mm -hmm. then we are well positioned. The issue is, can we now accelerate, uh, you know, the investments into the oil and gas sector so that we start to benefit from these high prices? The second one is, uh, we did some little research within the Stanbic group, and, and one of the things we established that usually when commodity prices go up, they take a lot longer to come down compared, say, to, you know, exchange rates or interest rates. And to the extent that Uganda is a net producer of agro-commodities, and we know that these prices have increased, certainly it's a wonderful opportunity that we should be taking advantage of. Mm -hmm. And I think looking at some of the budget estimates, um, you know, there is reason to believe that there is intent and investment in growing that production capacity so that we can take advantage of, you know, the higher prices in agri-commodities. Okay. Yeah. Well, you who is just uh, joining us, Stanbic Bank, uh, so it partnered to have a conversation on the budget analysis, reviewing emerging themes and uh, implications. There are questions that came in earlier mm -hmm. from the wide uh, public, and of course, mm -hmm. we're going to just, uh, uh, we usually say shoot. Mm -hmm. But of course, before I, I, <laughs> I get to you, Dr. Mohomuza, with that question, briefly comment on the slow growth, the risk of, you know, high inflation, and you also uh, talked about the implementation mm -hmm. in terms of the big lessons do you think uh, government picked on the lessons that have actually affected the implementing of these budget estimates to actually arrive at some of the solutions that could find that could be long-lasting yeah true when you read the document there are a lot of good proposals some of them drawing on, uh, on history um, I'm carrying my notebook here. Oh, Honorable Musenero came up with something called the pathogen economy. Mm -hmm. Talk about the silver lining mm -hmm. out of the crisis. Okay. Uh, while COVID was ravaging us, some of us were like, okay, where is the economics in this health confusion and problem? Mm -hmm. And we realized we can't actually do research and manufacture drugs uh, for mm -hmm. pathogens. Uganda is well known for having so many pathogens. Mm -hmm. Ebola, West Nile virus, and also Zika. All of them are around here. So tapping resources to research into this. And this is the opportunity to say, you Europeans, please give us the money because you don't know when Zika knocks on your doors. Yeah. So can we start the work now? Mm -hmm. So really she's looking into that space on how do you grow the research in that area, but also having conversations. Can we do the manufacturing of drugs? Mm -hmm. Apparently, India manufactures 60% of the world's vaccines. Mm -hmm. But the real patent holders are in Europe and the US. But for them, they are like, fine, you find the, the drug, me, I'll roll it out for you. And that's why they were able to survive Delta. When it was killing them, they just said, no more exports. We were here still waiting for somebody to donate. So the opportunities that have come through, and I was happy to see some allocation towards that science area. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to see the insistence of the president to say my scientists uh, need to be well facilitated. But the facilitation is also in terms of pay. But some of us are saying, where is the lab? Yeah. Who is training the future scientists? So it's the whole ecosystem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that we need to invest in. Uh, I saw the minister mentioning uh, taking advantage of these uh, high-priced products that Uganda can actually produce. You're talking about sunflower, you're talking about simsim, soya bean. 
these are things Uganda can actually produce. So we shouldn't mm. be saying, oh, Ukraine is not going to, this is an opportunity for us here. But the question goes back to, are we ready? Mm. Can we organize ourselves? Because I think India has been buying over $10 billion worth of soya bean from Ukraine. And as we speak, Ukraine cannot plant anymore because their window for planting is over. They are going into winter, autumn and winter. Mm -hmm. So, but Uganda's window for planting is just going to start in August. So are we ready? Have we mapped out the farmers and we giving them the seed? And the minister was talking about seed that matures faster. Mm -hmm. And this takes you back to the research. What is NARO doing? Mm -hmm. The NARO National Agricultural Research. Are we funding them to do these kinds of things? So those are the conversations you really want to say. But also talking about shooting. There is that war in Ukraine, but we also have some shooting on our own border. Mm -hmm. Can you access <laughs> the DRC border when Bunagana is closed by some mm -hmm. entity? So we don't want to miss that. That security mm -hmm. is also going to be critical and we need to put it into context. What is going to be available? What does that war mean to us? Mm -hmm. Is there any way we can find uh, other options? We have already lost traders, have lost things in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. Traders can lose either goods or services or whatever opportunities in DRC. So we're sitting in that fragile environment where the politicians need to speak and have conversations on how this budget is going to run. I'll come, I'll come back with you. Your question. <laughs> I'll go to Mr. Mirunji. Uh, Mr. Mirunji, th there's a narrative that has actually started on uh, agri agriculture, agri business versus manufacturing, as if they can't actually coexist but together. But whenever there's budget reading, the, the uh, narrative started of there's a bias on, on manufacturing vis-a-vis uh, -vis to to the agri-industry. Of course, you said you were surprised there was actually an increment. So speaking of these partnerships and how even manufacturing fuses into the agricultural agribusiness industry, speak to some of those that you think probably uh, could be adapted, you know, for the future uh, of, you know, the upcoming budgets. Certainly. And, <coughs> sorry. I think to separate the two is to make a, a fundamental mistake. Why? Because they are one and the same. Agro-business directly feeds into agro-industrialization for the simple reason that the value is usually at the point of industrialization. If you take coffee, the value is at the processed end, at that final cup of coffee that is delivered in a cafe. If you take uh, uh, doctor mentioned uh, soybean. Mm -hmm. At the end of that process, you have oil, you have seed cake. Mm -hmm. Those are critical ingredients. Oh, it's cocoa. Oh, it's cocoa. You have chocolate at the end. So, I think they, they, it's important that, uh, and, and it's good that there's a focus on how we can link these together. Mm -hmm. I've seen significant interventions around post-harvest handling mm -hmm. in this current budget. I've also seen significant interventions around uh, the building of storage facilities and enhancing of the warehousing and receipting system yeah. to allow collection, bulk collection of uh, items like soybean, items like uh, maize and the like. I think where the f uh, future budgets have to, to focus is how do we continue to incentivize investment in processing of some of these products. A bit of work has been done, but frankly, the thresholds that are still at play are well above uh, what's operational, $5 million in order to access a certain level of incentives. Mm -hmm. And our argument has been, make it such that I get to think about the opportunity cost of building a mall. If you make it such that if I build a three billion shillings mall, which is roughly uh, getting close to a million dollars. Okay, now it's 3.8 billion shillings. Then if at 3.8 billion shillings, as a Ugandan, I can access incentives around investing in uh, processing, a processing facility of some sort, I'll think about the opportunity there vis-a-vis -vis investing in a mall that's going to stay empty for half the time. The other thing is we need to also pay critical attention to the value we export. At the moment, we're having a key, uh, a, a key inability to retain a lot of our agro inputs by way of, co of seed cake, uh, by way of, uh, of, of husks from, for example, maize. And yet these are critical inputs into, into, into our, our animal feed production processes. If we retain these rather than sell maize, unprocessed maize, 
we then drive towards retaining some of that value here. Yes, there's a move to put to, to tax export of unprocessed grains. Good. Where else can we replicate some of these models? But how can we also ensure that when we refuse the export, we actually have the capacity to process it locally? <laughs> That's another question. Okay. Yeah. So, Ms. Makumbia, yours is beyond the parish development model, what other budget interventions have been put in place to ensure the economic growth or prosperity, which is the everyday concern? Um, I was uh, very pleased to see the climate uh, uh, um, change fund or fund for climate change. In a way, we are going back to that production level and anticipating the real challenges that our farmers are really faced with today. They can't quite work out what the season will be like, mm. uh, like their foref our forefathers were able to tell. And, uh, and I'll tell you that we have a platform where you try to go and teach X, but all the feedback that is coming to you is really related to these questions around the changes mm -hmm. that people are seeing around them. Yesterday I was reading a brochure which was actually um, um, uh, built by a group of, of, of development partners, SNV being in the lead, mm -hmm. but pointing to a certain area in the east around Bali and how in maybe 10 to 20 years time, it was a research it could not be able to produce something like potatoes, for instance, mm. because of the change that's happening. So you will agree trying with to the narrative of the economists that the future could be irrigation? The future is definitely tied with irrigation, and that's embedded within the, 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 the budget. The sums to it are definitely not adequate, yeah. but that's where the public public-private partnerships can come into play mm. and the infrastructure developments around it anyway. Some of these interventions require that environment, you know, because it's not enough. I've, I've seen projects whereby indeed there is a subsidy on, on irrigation equipment being given as near here as Buikwe. But when an assessment is being done, it is where you are located as a farmer. Mm. It is the flow of the water. You know, it's not for everybody, so you, it needs to be intentional that way. Mm -hmm. So I was pleased to see that uh, there's that element of, of, of considering the climate change because we really need a whole awareness campaign mm -hmm. and we really need some mitigation measures for the resilience to the same. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Mr. Mohinda, it's about inclusive financial access to even the everyday person. So from the banking sector, even specific to Stan Big Bank, what are you doing to make sure that everyone accesses uh, uh, funds and of course affordable affordability? Mm. You, you know, one of the reasons we were late for the studio, Mabel, we, we, we started a very hot debate, you know, whilst we were waiting to be prepared. Yeah. Uh, and we were trying to front run that question in, in one way or another, right? Mm -hmm. But it's important to set the context uh, for banking as it is. Of, and maybe I can get to stand big later on. I think w one appreciation must be that banking is a highly regulated uh, environment or industry with really, really stringent uh, requirements, regulatory requirements by Bank of Uganda, that when we do lend out public money, that we lend it on decisions that are, are based on data, mm -hmm. right? Why that is important is because people trust you with their money. Mm -hmm. If they come back the next day and they don't find it, then there is a, a national crisis, okay? I think that context is very important. But I if, if I think about inclusivity in, in really, really simple terms, I think about it from uh, a perspective of can everyone who wishes to access financing be able to access it? Now there are two things there. One is that I must have some little bit of information about you mm -hmm. in order to give you this public finance money. And two, I must be able to reach you wherever you are. You don't have to come to Kampala mm -hmm. or you know, travel to another part of the country to access this funding. But I think that particular question of being able to reach uh, people has been answered. Mm -hmm. The mobile today really has solved that problem. Mm -hmm. So the one thing that we are, are, are left with is really around how do we get information that we don't have? How do we get data that we don't have in order to be able to uh, make a lending decision mm -hmm. so that I can lend you know, to a person that ordinarily in the course of business I might have thought twice to lend to. 
And that's where we were sharing about, uh, you know, the issue of being creative. Mm. Trying to be creative in how do I answer this information question or information gap. And I think to that extent, uh, and this is where I come now to stand big, to that extent there are two things that we've, we've tried to do. One of them is the enterprise, economic enterprise restart fund. Uh, interestingly, uh, Josephine was among <laughs> our first partners when we started it. We started it as a, as a response to COVID and trying to sponsor, you know, recovery of, of the economy. Uh, the funds that are available there are uniquely priced, comparable to, for example, what you find at micro supports, micro finance support center today at 10 percent. Okay. Uh, we are aiming to reach about 60 billion. Again, the question is, you need to be doing more, mm -hmm. and I'll come to that. We're aiming to reach about 60 billion by the end of this year. Uh, we will have probably reached about 6,000 circles mm -hmm. by the end of this year. And that could easily translate maybe to about 1 to 1 1.5 million individuals or something of that sort. That's something that had not happened before. But the second uh, uh, intervention has really been the uh, Stanbic incubator. Um, and within the Stanbic incubator, what we've really tried to do is to, you know, get the people that operate in micro, small enterprises and try to give them, you can call it a master class session in how to run a business on records, have some good governance structure in place. Those two are important because once you achieve those, once you have records, once you have some established structure, even if it's two or three people in a business, then immediately the business becomes bankable. Now that's very different from the historical approach of, you know, we see you, but sorry, we can't lend to you. Mm -hmm. We're saying we see you, we know who you are, <laughs> We want to help you but. to make your bankable. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the incubator is, is open to anybody, not just uh, uh, somebody that would have to bank with Stanbic or is banking with Stanbic. So those are the two areas, uh, you know, where we've tried to employ some creativity. Now, on the issue of is that enough, that's what I was sharing with, uh, you know, my panelists earlier on, that we've got to partner this is not something that is achievable by one institution mm -hmm. or by one industry. There is lots of capital outside of Uganda that is looking to make a meaningful change in people's lives. We have to be creative in accessing it, but accessing it as partners so that we cushion each other's risks where there are risks and we get funds out to uh, um, the different categories of people that are not able to access funding today. Okay, that is Mr. Alan Mohinda, Head of Global Markets, Stanbic Bank, Uganda Limited. I will return to you your question, and it's on parish development model. And they say that it would be ideal providing supply and uh, market for manufacturing, but are there any potential areas of partnership between the public and private sector to actually make it successful? Yeah, thank you, and I really want to Br pick out from mm. <laughs> Mohinda's point of partnerships yeah supporting households is understanding the linkages who do you want to partner with what are they bringing on the table mm -hmm. what are they taking out from the table and uh, this would speak to my uh, domain now because I have uh, a seat at the Macquarie University Business School in the Department of Economics where we're saying how do you make this like a teaching hospital yeah. you know you're teaching but it's actually treating mm -hmm. as well so we want to convert these university departments, School of Economics in Makerere and then Makerere University Department of Economics, Dental the business school, school <laughs> and, and make sure you interact with the practitioners <laughs> to blend and bring the knowledge through. Now, when you look at a household, manufacturers quite often will say, I only want to look at the inputs that they bring in, agro-industrialization. Mm. But remember, they are also the market for whatever you are producing. So mm. those are the partnerships you want to say. These households are not just providers yeah. of agricultural raw materials that the manufacturers need. After they have manufactured, the thing they need most is a market. Mm. And if these households are poor because they are in subsistence, then even the banker is going to have a problem. 
the fellow he lent the money needed to sell to pay back the banker. So economics is about those linkages okay. and interrelationship. And want to bring really that strongly at the economics business forum, MOOCs business forum, but also the other research with the other universities to say how do you help this household get out of subsistence? What are their fears? What are their worries? Because every borrower has a risk. Now, talking about partners abroad, BRAC, BRAC says, when I look at the people who failed to pay me, they actually sold the investment to pay school fees. Yeah. They sold the investment to treat a sick child. Mm -hmm. So can I therefore argue with everybody to clean up that space? Because it is a kind of pillaging my, my investment here. It's bringing a risk. So they go to partners and borrow money to invest and support investment in the health sector and in education scholarships mm -hmm. to protect their own investment in the banking sector. So I want to strengthen that linkages and partnerships is the way to go. And we need to understand them in the Paris development model. All those seven pillars do matter. Okay. I'm not happy with some politicians who are downgraded to one of financial inclusion. <laughs> I will take them on and to them in my military <laughs> green combat. I will go to Bunagana for them. <laughs> okay, Mr. Rirunji, your concluding remarks. Yeah, my concluding remarks are just an extension of the discussion on partnership, really. Briefly. And, and <laughs> this is, uh, and, and it's around using existing systems. Coiling it on your concluding remarks. Yes, yes. using existing systems <laughs> to support uh, to, to support the growth of, of, of some of these sectors. What do I mean? I mean, we already have an excellent, relatively excellent uh, uh, credit reference bureau that is serving mostly the banking sector. Mm -hmm. Could we have this extended to the private sector as well? Why do I say this? Because a lot of the credit in this town is actually not provided by bankers. It's provided by private sector players who extend 90s, 180-day uh, credit to people they hardly know whether they'll pay back. Mm. Where is the discussion around extending these linkages so that private sector can also know that Daniel has defaulted three times in three separate places and therefore you should put him on a watch list. The second element of that would be around the issue of a fraud database. Mm. In the last two years, mm. we've lost about, in the manufacturing sector alone, about $10 million due to fraud. What's the cross-cutting mm. line that you see among these, the people who perpetrate this fraud? They're the same people, jumping from one entity to another <laughs> to another. Mm. All it takes is a fraud database that says, look, this is a risk, let's mm. not invest there. Mm. Third, for me, would be around something I expected to see. Uh, we've talked about the losses from South Sudan. We know there are potential losses from early entry into DRC. The learning here should be could we have an export guarantee, export uh, insurance facility paid for by those who are going into these markets? Mm. Because what it does is it shields government. Instead of having arrears to pay on your books, the people are paid by the insurance facility. <laughs> lastly, final lastly, <laughs> uh, would be on uh, government's appetite for domestic borrowing and the impact it has on one, the interest rates in the economy, and crowding out of private sector from access to some of these facilities. We know they, they, we need the money. Could we go the way, because at the biggest percentage of the budget is going to infrastructure expenditure. Why don't we go the way of infrastructure bonds? Because we have a fund, NSSF, that is investing in infrastructure bonds in Kenya and Tanzania. Mm. Why not Uganda? Ms. Mkombia, <laughs> what's the take home, briefly? Yes. Um, this all opens to me a very huge opportunity of simplifying, really in very simple terms, simplifying uh, this budget to the public, finding a way. I think the people on this panel all can have a role. How, how do we get it out there? Because I think it's also a very good way of accountability. I see some very good points therein that if we don't achieve, the promise is so much, and indeed the expenditure lines may continue even when the revenue lines are not met. So to hold all each other accountable, I think there could be some simple ways, some simple terms in which we can uh, disseminate the, the key aspects of this budget. And when I would really like to speak for PDM, for instance, the parish development model, um, to say that it, 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 there is one pillar that is more known than others, 
uh, but we can have the facilities. I, I come from a capacity building entity, making it our life's work to see that we can disseminate more of this because the more they really know the facts, it's not enough to get the facility, even in yoga. They need to be well equipped across all the seven pillars to make the best use of it. And if we want to see uh, getting into, we need three years to get into, uh, uh, of record to show that we've really moved on into another, uh, um, uh, another era. It means that even our enterprises, it means that even our farmers, it means that even our, inter uh, our agribusinesses need these three years of growth. So if they take the facility today, if they get the support today via the parish development model, what about tomorrow? Okay. So I think what I'm seeing there as an opportunity for the Agribusiness Development Center is to develop the capacity using e-learning platforms, which are also being uh, budgeted for in this particular instance, so that we can actually have that information in the place where we need to have it. Thank you. Okay, and mm. Mr. Muhinda, in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's an impossible task. But uh, <laughs> Mabel, first of all, on behalf of the other panelists, let me congratulate the, the minister and the PSST for a, mm -hmm. a well thought out uh, policy statement. I think that's number one. Uh, because it goes to the heart of, you know, the question of productivity, the question of production. Okay. But I think outside of that, uh, maybe two or three things that I would like to say. The first one is, for us to be able to achieve these objectives, we shall have to fine tune and in some places, you know, radically change mm -hmm. the way we execute our policy intentions. That's yeah, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I or already alluded to it, financing the deficit whilst containing the cost. Mm -hmm is going to be one that requires some level of creativity. And I think as one of the financiers, uh, you know, the, the minister has left us with a challenge mm -hmm. to think about how can we help him with that problem, and we welcome it, and we will work towards it. I think the last one for me is that, um, you know, we are acutely aware of the challenges that are before us um, as a nation, but there are opportunities that this budget presents, that this environment presents. And uh, we are open at Stanbic to assist in some of these. Daniel, you talk about um, you know, exporting to uh, uh, Sudan and losing your, your goods. We have export schemes where you, know, you don't have to take the risk. You know, somebody else takes the risk. Mm. So all these are opportunities that are available, solutions that are, are available to you know, the general public that we can support with. Yeah. All right, as we conclude, uh, Mr. Alan Mohinda is the head of global markets at Stan Big Bank Uganda Limited and the only female, Ms. Josephine <laughs> Mukumbia, <laughs> Executive Director, Agribusiness Development Center. And then we have Mr. Daniel uh, Birunji, the di Executive Director, Uganda Manufacturers Association and Economist. <laughs> that is Dr. Fred Mohomoza. Um, we do appreciate you so much for watching and also Stan Big Bank Uganda Limited for this budget analysis, uh, reviewing the emerging themes and implications. My name is Mebo Tuegumieza. Okay, no more programming continues.